Let us begin. <laughs> Not that we have a choice. All right. So, I forgot my power cable, but supposedly Ezra, the can what used to be the cameraman, will come by and get my keys and go pick it up. Because if I, I have a bad battery, it won't last the whole class. So, I guess you can hope either way, right? One, one hope is he gets the battery, and the other possible hope is he does, I mean, gets a cord, or maybe you wish he doesn't get the cord. We'll see. So if he comes in, I have to stop for just one minute. All right, so we're going to talk today about co something called confidence intervals. So the idea here is that, for example, everybody knows if we have a group of samples and we'd like to calculate the mean, we do that, right? We take all the sample values, add them up, um, and divide by n, and that's, that's, the sam that's called the sample mean, right? And hopefully at some point here, you have some um, feeling that the more samples you get, the better, right? So if you want to calculate the mean and you have two samples, that's probably not a good idea. So you get some idea of that, and right, associated with this um, is something called the true mean, right? So underlying, there's some probability distribution function that you usually don't know, but there's some true mean. And of course, what we'd like is the, at the sample mean to be near the true mean, because the true mean is what we're interested in. And we have a feeling that the more samples we get, the better, right? Um, so this idea of confidence intervals kind of quantifies this. So we can, we can ask the question um, something like, how confident are we about this estimate, okay? And what we'll learn is that the more samples we have, the more confident we'll be, okay? And what it's really going to come down to, for example, with this mean, is to say, um, we'll be, we can specify what confidence level we want. Like, we want to be 95% confident that this mean is between this value and this value. And then we can calculate what that range is. That range is called the confidence interval. So again, in statistics, if you ask the question, I want to be 100% confident, then the range is minus infinity to infinity. Then you'll be 100%. <laughs> But if you want to be 95% confident or 90% confident, I'll teach you today how to calculate the range um, on this. And you can specify any confidence level you want and calculate whatever range you want. And you'll see that these confidence l limits shrink, get closer together as we have more samples. Okay? So that's kind of where we're going. Um, so I'm going to talk about two kinds of estimation. One is what we typically do. That's called point estimate. This is called a point estimate. And then I'm going to talk about something called maximum likelihood estimation. Um, that's different. We're not going to use it a lot in the class, but I wanted to explain it to you because this is a very common tool people use in statistics. Um, and so you'll often hear the word maximum likelihood okay, when it comes to statistics. So I just want to explain what that means, even though we're not going to use it extensively so you have the background. The main focus will be on part three, um, calculating the confidence interval on both our estimate of the mean and our estimate of the variance or standard deviation, either way you want to look at it. Um, and the final part is something called the central limit theorem. So all the methods essentially that we talk about in the class um, assume that the governing distribution is a normal distribution. Um, and so the question is, what if the, what if the distribution is not actually normal? Right? So should you be concerned? So typically you don't know what the distribution is, but there's no guarantee the data will come from a normal distribution. So what the central limit theorem says is in the limits you have a lot of samples, everything looks normal. <laughs> you'll, you'll see what I mean. Okay? So it gives us what in mathematics is called a warm fuzzy feeling. I don't know if you've heard of this. Um, that using the assumption of normal distributions will be good, especially in the limit as we have a lot of samples. Okay? I'm wondering where my cord recovery individual is. Um. All right. Okay, so here's a little bit of background and motivation for what we're trying to do, which I kind of alluded to already, is that, um, pr so when I say parameters of a distribution, what I mean is, so for example, we have the normal distribution we learned last time that's completely determined by the mean, the true mean, right? And then um, what we called sigma squared. 
that's the true variance, okay? So if, if you know the true mean, you know the true variance, you can calculate the probability distribution function. I gave it to you last time, okay? And of course, what we really want to do, or have to do, if you will, is we have to estimate these things from samples because we don't know the true values, okay? And so again, we have a true mean, a true variance, and then we have an estimate. So this is sometimes called the sample mean and the sample variance, the values calculated from samples. What I'll teach you today is there's more than one way to calculate this from samples. Okay. You can do point estimation or maximum likelihood, as I'll show you. Okay. All right. Um, unless we have an infinite number of samples, so I can tell you that if you sample from a distribution randomly an infinite number of times and calculate this number, you'll get the true mean. Okay. But the problem is you need an infinite number of samples. That's not very practical. So that means when you calculate this sample mean, it's going to have some uncertainty associated with it. You can't be sure it's the true mean. In fact, it won't be. There's the cord recovery man. Okay, I appreciate this. I hope to never make this mistake again. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to take this key, okay? You're not going to drive the car. Okay. You're um, <laughs> going to take this key, go into my office. On the, on the desk, you'll see a cord sticking out. You'll see it's plugged underneath. It's a Dell cord. If you could get it and bring it to me, because this will not last. All right, right away. Okay. It's very polite. Much more polite than I was at his age, that's for sure. Okay. Okay. So, um, because we have some uh, uh, finite number of samples, there'll be some uncertainty, and we're looking to establish something like this. Okay, this is the notation. So, theta here is a parameter, meaning, for our purposes, it's either the mean or the standard deviation or the variance. This is a lower limit, this is an upper limit, and what this, this notation means is that we're we, this means whatever gamma is, this is the so-called confidence level. A common number is 95% or 0.95. So this means you're 95, for example, 95% confident that the true mean is between this, these two limits. Okay? And so what we need to do if we're going to work with this is I'm, you calculate the sample mean and variance. You get a confidence level. That's something you choose. It's a design parameter, and then you calculate this theta 1 and theta 2, okay? So this gives you some idea of how confident you are in your, e in your estimates, okay? So, for example, if, if you did, if you wrote something like this, what? Your conclusion would be that you, you know the mean pretty well. <laughs> okay, it's between 1.1. You're 95% sure it's between 1.11 and 1.12. Okay. On the other hand, if it looked like this, then you don't even know if the mean's positive or negative. You don't know kind of anything about the mean. So, you know, anybody can calculate the average of a number of samples. But the key thing here is, do you have any confidence in the number you're producing? Okay. In this case, you have a very high level of confidence. In this, in this case, you have essentially no confidence at all in what the number is. It matters. Okay. So the idea here is reporting just the mean or just the variance is not enough. You want to report something about how confident you are. So that's where we're, that's where we're headed. Okay. So that's what we're going to be doing for the most part today. Okay. Everyone knows this. It's just kind of um, repeating what we've talked about in various places. So random variable x, yeah, we should be familiar with this now. The examples I often use, for example, are molecular weight of a polymer, a thickness of a thin film, or anything you might want, but I like those examples. So we often talk about this idea of random sampling, okay? So the idea is that you are looking at the film thickness, let's say, of a solar cell. Underlying that is some distribution of thin thicknesses. You don't know what that distribution is. We're often willing to assume it's a normal distribution, but we don't actually even know that. Okay. So by random sampling, it means that it's unbiased sampling. You take samples from the distribution, and there's no, there's no bias to how those samples are done. Of course, they're done according to their probability, if you know what I mean. It's kind of like if you were flipping a coin, or rolling a dice, there's a certain probability you'll get each outcome, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not biased in any way. 
Okay? So that's what all outcomes equally likely to be uh, sampled. So a better way to do this perhaps is to show a picture. So if you're sampling, let's say, from the normal distribution, that's probably the best normal distribution I've ever drawn, and it's still not that good. All right? Um, so this is x, and this is f of x. So when I mean sampling, I mean you're randomly selecting um, values that come from that distribution. So you understand it's, it's more likely that you'll sample a value here because it's more probable. That's not what I mean by uh, that is still random. That's still unbiased. Um, by bias sampling, I mean if somehow I had a system where it was more likely I'd get numbers above the mean and then below the mean, that would be biased. That would not be random. Okay? So we always assume sampling is random because everything we do assumes that. Um, and so the idea is that if we don't know the underlying distribution, we assume we can learn something about the statistical properties of the system from the samples. That's the whole idea <laughs> of the whole course, or this part of the course. Okay? As an example, we assume that if we collect a number of samples and calculate the mean, that it's somehow related to the true mean. Otherwise, we wouldn't do that, right? I mean, that's why we want to use a certain number of samples. You wouldn't calculate the mean from one sample. You can use the equation for any number of samples you want, right? It's kind of like you guys do linear regression, right? Hopefully, you don't do linear regression with two points. I mean, obviously, you can draw a line between two points. It's not very reliable, perhaps, though. So, you know, we can calculate things like the mean from samples. We can calculate the variance from samples. Sometimes we'll talk about the standard deviation, which you probably hear more about. That's just S, so it's just the square root of that thing. Okay, so we've, we've talked about this before. Um, and so, this is really wordy. <laughs> Description, I think I, I extracted this from the book. So it let me give you an example of what I mean by point estimation. Okay? So we, we know for a Gaussian distribution, that's the probability function. We talked about that last time. It's completely characterized by a mean and, a, and a, in this case, standard deviation. And again, that means true mean and true standard deviation. And so the idea of point estimation is we take a number of samples, we calculate the mean, and that's an estimate. So if you ever see the term, something called something hat, that means estimate of that. So when you see um, mu hat, that means an estimate of mu. Okay. So this is, how we est this is how we estimate mu, right? We don't know it. We take a number of samples, compute the mean, and that's considered our estimate of it. Okay. Same thing with the variance. Calculate the variance and... Um, that's our best S, so from the samples calculate the variance, sample variance called S squared. That's our best estimate of the true variance. Okay, so this is called point estimation for the Gaussian distribution. You might remember the binomial distribution. We talked about that last time. Remember? That was the, you were interested in the probability if you did N experiments, how many times would you get a certain outcome? The number of times you got that outcome was called X. P was the probability you'd get that outcome. Q is the probability to get a different outcome. Okay. This is probability function. So we know for this distribution, because I told you last time, the mean of this distribution is the number of samples that you collect times P, which is the probability of getting the outcome you're interested in. So if you want to, for example, estimate the probability P, then, well, you can see from this equation, that's mu divided by n. But since you don't know mu, you could, you could estimate what mu is by putting in the, the value you calculate from samples that you collect. Right? So in other words, knowing this relationship, calculate the mean from another number of samples, divide by the total number of samples, and that's your, that's your um, estimate of what the probability of success is. I and mean, that's a no, kind of a no-brainer, right? If you, you want to know, like let's say you were not very smart and you were flipping a coin and you didn't know what the probability of getting a heads was, right? So you'd flip the coin 10 times, see how many times you got heads, divide, and that'd be your estimate of the probability you get heads. Right? If you flip it two times and you get heads two times and do this, you'll say there's a 100% chance you'll get heads. Again, you're not very smart, let's say. <laughs> All right. So, you know, again, this is going to work better as we have a large number of samples. So this is normally when we talk about, you know, estimating parameters or calculating sample means and variance. This is the way in this class we talk about doing it. And I'm sure you've seen this before this class. This is nothing new to you. Here's something new, and a lot of statistical methods are based on this, and I'm just going to go over this in a few slides 
It's a little bit mathematical, admittedly, but we haven't had enough math yet, in my opinion. So, um, I'm going over this to give you some idea about how this particular group of methods work. And so when you hear the term maximum likelihood, you'll know kind of what's being referred to. Okay? I'm not proposing that you could do a lot of statistical analysis using maximum likelihood estimates, because I'm not giving you enough information to do that. But I want you at least to be familiar with the terminology and the basic idea behind it. All right. So certainly we've seen this first thing. So let's say we have a probability function, x. So it's a function f, x is the variable, the random variable, and then theta is some parameter of that particular distribution. Okay? So the, for example, in the normal distribution, it has two parameters. It has the mean and the variance. But to make life simple, I want to start off just assuming the distribution is characterized by a single parameter, just to illustrate what I'm talking about. Okay? All right, and so the idea here is that we are willing to assume what the distribution is, but we want some way of estimating what the parameter is of that distribution. So, and we're going to do it differently than the last slide. The last slide we calculated the mean and the variance from the samples in the normal way. Okay? We're going to do it a little bit differently here. All right, so we have this distribution function. We've assumed its form, but we don't know the value of this parameter theta that is involved in the distribution function. So we're going to try to estimate it from samples. Okay, so we collect a bunch of samples of x, do some experiments, collect one experiment, two, three, get the value of x for each of those experiments. Okay? Now, if you remember what um, this means, this means this is the probability that you'll get the value x. You have to plug it in, actually, on the other side. You don't have to plug it in, by the way. But he's hardcore, you know. He doesn't stop until the job's done. I appreciate that. All right, so we're going to use a little different method here, but it's still involves Thanks so much for doing that. Um, collecting samples, OK? So you do n experiments, collect values. And then remember what the probability function means. It means this is the probability. It looks like this, right? So if you look at a particular value of x, that's the probability you get that value of x in, a, in an experiment. This is most likely. <laughs> Way out here is very unlikely. Okay? So what is fx1 of theta? Okay? That means that's the probability that you do a single experiment and the outcome is x1. Okay? Same thing for the second experiment. That's the probability you do a single experiment and get x2. What is those two things multiplied together? That's the probability you'll do two experiments, because these experiments are assumed to be independent of each other. That you do two experiments, and the outcome of the first experiment is x1, and the outcome of the second experiment is x2. You follow that? And so if I multiply all these functions together, evaluated at the values that I obtained from these experiments, this tells me the probability that these should have been the outcome of n experiments. Probably the first experiment, probably a second experiment, okay? And now my goal is to find this param... And so this thing here is called the likelihood function. In other words, it's the likelihood I would have done n experiments and got these values, okay? So now what I want to do, I don't know the value theta. I would like to find the value theta to make this likelihood as, as great as possible. So the reasoning behind that is, um, I've done a set of experiments, and I don't know the value theta. I'm going to try to find the value theta such that the results of my experiments are as likely as possible. I mean, why would you do the other thing? I'll find the value of the parameter that makes my results the least likely possible. <laughs> right? That wouldn't make any sense. So this is what's known as called maximizing the likelihood. So the first thing you have to do is form this likelihood function. Again, and this tells you the likelihood this is a, would have been the outcome of n experiments. And then we're going to try to find the parameter that maximizes that thing. We think that's the best estimate of the parameter that we could find, the one that maximizes the chances that was the outcome. Okay? Now, if you know anything about calculus, which I know you do, that if you have a function and you would like to maximize or minimize it, you take the derivative. Right? Tell me you know this. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to take this likelihood function, we're going to take the derivative of the thing we don't know, right? Because we want to maximize this function with respect to this parameter theta. So we're going to set that equal to zero. Now I can tell you, if you don't know this, maximizing the derivative of the likelihood is the same as maximizing the log of the likelihood. 
In other words, they give you the same answer for theta. Why do this? Because it's going to be easier sometimes to work with the log of the likelihood function, which I'll show you in a minute. Okay? So I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter which way you do it. This is more convenient, especially if you're working with the Gaussian distribution. Okay? All right, so this is the basic um, outline. So I would say that if you want, the main thing I want you to take away from the maximum likelihood is, I'm not saying don't pay attention now, but I'm saying is the basic idea of why this makes any sense and what the likelihood function is and what it represents. Okay. So on the next slide, if I don't, if I'm not forgetting, I'm going to show how to use this to, with the Gaussian distribution. And this is where it gets kind of cumbersome mathematically, and I wouldn't bother writing down all these equations. They're in the notes. Okay. All right. So if you have, let's say you have a distribution function with more than one parameter, like, right, the Gaussian distribution has two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. Then you have to take the derivative of the likelihood function with all the parameters that you don't know. Okay, so if it involves two parameters, like the Gaussian distribution, you'll need to take the derivative with respect to the mean and of the standard deviation. Set those equal to zero and attempt to solve the resulting equations for the mean and the variance. And those will be your estimates of what the mean and the variance are. Okay? All right. So this is where it gets a little bit hairy. Um, so what I'm forming now is the likelihood function assuming that the distribution of interest, which it normally is, is the Gaussian distribution. So I have to go back. Don't, don't try to write this. It's not safe. Okay? So there's the likelihood function. So what I got to do is I got to plug in my f into this equation. And the f for this equation is that. Okay? So, I got, so f of x1 means I put an x1 there. f of x2 means I put an x2 there. Okay? I multiply all those things together, I get that. Okay? It's a bit cumbersome. So you can simplify this because you can see the leading coefficient here is all the same. I multiply that together n times so I get that thing to the n power. And if you remember the property of exponentials, if you multiply exponentials, you can, you can put them all together in one term and add the exponents. Do you remember that? Okay. So I'm just gathering all these terms that are in the exponential here, gathering them into something called h, which is all those terms just added together. You can rewrite it like this. So I have a minus h, that accounts for the minus sign. There's the 2 from there. I pull the sigma squared out there, and then I have the sum involving all those terms. You know, x1 minus mu squared, x2 minus, so on and so forth. Okay? I'm doing all these gyrations because I'm trying to set this up so that I'm going to be able to take the derivative of this thing with respect to mu and sigma and make it as simple as possible. Okay? All right. So this is, the reason using the log of the likelihood function is useful is because you have this exponential term, right? And when you apply the log, it'll, it'll get rid of the exponential term. So now I'm using this, I, well, it's not an identity, but it's an equation, okay? So I'm taking, instead of using the likelihood function directly, I'll use the log of the likelihood because finding the derivative will give me the same answer. It's easier to work with. So well, I have to go back and forth, kind of painful, but so I'm going to take the log of this thing. So what do you get? If you take the log of like A times B, you get the log of A plus the log of B, right? And if you have the log of E to like minus H, that's just minus H. So when all said and done, you can rewrite this thing like this, okay? The first term, you know, that term that was to the nth power had that in the numerator, I believe, and that in the denominator, is that right? Uh, n, oh, okay. anyway, <laughs> n's coming out because it's the exponent, and then you have this term, a 2 pi, sorry, there, you have sigma there, that yields those two terms. I just told you how you get the h there because you apply the log to the e to the minus h, and you get minus h. Okay, all right, so now you aspire to take the derivative of this thing with respect to mu, take the derivative of this thing with respect to sigma, okay? And then you hope that you can solve the resulting equation for uh, sigma and, sorry, sigma squared and mu, okay? So if you want, this is where it helps to know the chain rule. You remember the, chill, the chain rule of differentiation? Okay. So what I want to do here is take the derivative of this function with respect to mu. That does not depend on mu. That does not depend on mu. But this thing does depend on mu. So that's why I get minus h with respect to mu, okay? And if you go back and look what H looks like, you'll see it looks like that, okay? 
And so do you remember how to take the derivative of that thing? So first of all, the two is going to come out. It's going to cancel that two. And then I'm going to take the derivative. I'm going to get a minus coming out of here. OK, so it's going to end up looking like that. The minus sign got canceled. The two got canceled. And I get that. OK? The, this is, <laughs> so what's going to happen here? At the end, you're going to be underwhelmed by the result. OK? So this is maybe a bad combination. A lot of, lot of equations, and at the end, you'll be like, duh, watch. You can say duh when we get there. I won't be mad. All right? So there we go. We got this equation here. So obviously, sigma squared, you can multiply across. Then you get just that this thing is equal to 0. You can pull the uh, mu out, right? Because mu is a constant. So you get this thing, n times mu. And now you want to solve this thing for mu. Okay? That's your estimate of what mu is going to be. It's the mu that maximizes the likelihood. That's what you said you wanted to do. It is 1 over n times the sum of the values. So is at least one person going to go duh or something like that? No? Whatever. OK, somebody did. But it wasn't with much enthusiasm. Whatever. All right? So it's the same answer we got before. OK? It's, it's the sample mean. It was a lot more work to get there. Um, but still, the same answer we got before. I think I'm going to um, save you the details of this one. But it's the same kind of thing. Now I take the derivative of this thing with respect to sigma. Sigma is involved there. It's also involved in h. If you work out the whole equation, you'll end up finding, take the derivative, you'll end up finding this. And if you simplify this for sigma squared, you'll find it equals this. Does that, that should look pretty familiar. But it's not exactly the same. Because usually when we estimate the variance, we multiply 1 over n minus 1, right? When you normally calculate the, 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 um, the uh, variance, what do you do? You take the samples, you subtract off x bar, which is mu hat, same thing, square it, sum them all up and divide by 1 over n minus 1. In this case, it says we should actually just do 1 over n. It's a little bit different, but pretty much the same. Okay? So that's why I put it's this, not the same as how you normally do s squared, which is right there, right? So the difference is this n minus 1. Okay, so, well, this was a lot of work to get to something that wasn't, you know, a lot different, you could argue. So why did I do this to you? I didn't really, I couldn't help myself here, to be honest with you, but <laughs> I really wanted to impart to you that when you see statistical methods, they say things like maximum likelihood. What, what is being done usually on the computer, like in MATLAB, is they're forming this likelihood function and they're doing these calculations and and you can do this for any distribution you want. It doesn't have to just be the normal distribution. So when we go into MATLAB, you'll see for every distribution that they have available, of which there's like 26 different distributions, there's a maximum likelihood function associated with that distribution. For the normal distribution, it does just what we did here. But it does a similar thing for the binomial, for the Poisson, any other distribution you want. So, all right. So that's your introdu introduction to maximum likelihood. I bet you've had enough. All right, good. OK, so now let's talk about confidence intervals. So now we're assuming that we've obtained an estimate of the mean and the variance. And at this point, I'm saying we did it like this, the normal point estimation way we call that. And we'd like to specify confidence intervals on this value. So again, um, this theta here is going to be some parameter of the distribution. Because we're obsessed with the normal distribution, it's going to be the mean and the variance. Okay. I think MATLAB actually does the mean and the standard deviation, but it doesn't really matter. Okay? So we're going to calculate these limits, theta 1 and theta 2, according to some confidence level. Okay? So in other words, we're going to have a group of samples. From the samples, we're going to calculate the mean. From the confidence level, we're going, and the, and the mean, and the number of samples, we're going to calculate this region here. And it's going to end up giving us answers like I wrote on the board. It gives you some indication how confident you are in your estimate. If this theta 1 and theta 2 are close to each other, that means you're highly confident in the value you've obtained. If not, you don't have much confidence. Okay? And you'll see that as we increase the number of samples, this will shrink. You'll become more and more confident about what the answer is. You also should have an idea that as you make this confidence level smaller and smaller, it also gets wider. I mean, it gets smaller, I should say. Right, if I make this confidence level 100%, I want to be 100% confident the mean is between these limits. Then it's minus infinity to plus infinity. That's how you can be 100% confident. 
So if you want it to be 99% confident, they're going to tend to be wide apart, 95 closer, 90. If you only want to be 10% confident it's in there, it's going to be really close together. It's not very useful, but you could do it that way. Okay, so to, to do the confidence intervals on the mean and the confidence intervals on the variance, we need to introduce two d new distributions, one of which I bet you've seen and one of which you probably haven't seen, but I don't know. Okay, so we're not going to use these distribution functions in detail. We're going to use the tables in the book that, that provide values of this distribution function. Okay, but I just want to at least tell you what the distribution function is. So there's two distributions. One that governs the confidence interval on the mean, meaning this is the distribution function one uses to calculate the confidence intervals for the mean. And then another one, this is the t-distribution, one called the chi-squared distribution that governs the confidence interval on the variance. Okay? So depending on which confidence interval you're interested in, use this distribution or this one. Okay? This is table A9 in the, the book. And this is table A10 in the book. And you might recall tables A7 and A8 are both for the normal distribution. Okay? So you don't need to actually know this function, but you do know how to, you de, do know, <laughs> tongue twister, you do need to know how to use the tables in the book. Okay? So this guy is the T distribution. You may have, sometimes people call this the student T distribution, the student T test. I don't know if you've ever seen this in any class you've had. Um, and then this is the chi-squared distribution. So rather than give you any details about the distribution functions, because we don't use directly use those, I'll show you how to use the tables. Okay? All right, so this is like a recipe. Like I always say, this is like baking a cake, right? You just go through this and get the answer. Okay? So I, in this class, um, we don't spend a lot of time, like let's say you took a statistics class in the math department. They'd probably prove all this stuff. Right? They try to talk about confidence intervals for two or three weeks. And for two sessions, they'd prove, you know, prove mathematically that this is how it's done. So we're engineers. We don't have a lot of time for proof. We hope the mathematicians know what they're doing. Um, so this is a well-established method. So I'm not going to try to give you the underlying statistical derivation for it. I'm just going to try to teach you how to use it. Okay? So here's the situation we have. We have data, okay? We've collected a bunch of samples. We assume that these come from a Gaussian distribution or a normal dist okay? We're, that's an assumption. We're, we're making an assumption like we will throughout most of the course that the data we've collected comes from a normal distribution. So we're going to say that's the underlying distribution, <coughs> but we don't know the mean or variance of that distribution, which is usually the case, okay? So you're willing to make an assumption that it's Gaussian, but you don't know the mean or variance of that underlying distribution, so you're going to try to compute them, okay? So the first thing you do is choose the confidence level. That's how confident do you want to be that the values within the ranges you're going to calculate, okay? A typical value is 95%, just what everyone uses, sometimes 90%, okay? Like you want to be pretty confident it's in the region. You don't usually take 50% or something. So, you know, sometimes 90, 95, 99, something like that. Okay. All right. Then there's something with all these methods called the degrees of freedom. Okay. The degrees of freedom is usually slightly different than number n. In this case, it's n minus 1. The idea is that if you estimate a parameter using the data, you so-called lose a degree of freedom in the data. So that's why it's n minus 1. It's kind of a little hard to explain maybe. But to use this table or this method, you have to calculate the degrees of freedom. So you take the number of data points you have, subtract off one, that's called M, that's the degrees of freedom.